Thank you everyone for joining us here today um, to talk about mental health, well-being and resilience. My name is Varsha Devi Balakrishnan. I'm CESA's National Secretary. Mental health is a really topical discussion given COVID-19, but it's been something that's really important to me, so much so that I'm actually currently pursuing a master's in counselling. Joining me in the panel discussion today, we have Carson, Clinical Services Manager from Headspace Sunshine, Gina, Associate Director, Employment and Education Partnership from Origin, and Professor Stewart, Deputy Director and Medical Dean in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Queensland. Thank you, uh, panelists, for joining us today. Before we jump into the panel discussion, let's hear a quick word from our session sponsor, SETI Melbourne. Um, so Study Melbourne was really happy to sponsor this session on international student mental health, well-being and resilience as it aligns really strongly with Victoria's focus and support for international students. The Study Melbourne Student Centre provides access to telephone counselling and referral to mental health services for students alongside case management to assist students in really difficult situations. And of course, this has been particularly critical during this time of uncertainty, uh, with many international students experiencing social isolation and financial hardship. Origin has been a key partner for us and has received two Study Melbourne grants, uh, the first to engage with international students on mental health issues and a follow-on project just approved to train 40 international student peer workers with a lived experience of mental illness to help provide reach out and responsive support to students in need. I'm sure this will be a very interesting and thought-provoking discussion on what is a critically important and very timely topic. I hope you have a great session. Thank you. Again, thank you, Study Melbourne, for sponsoring our session. All right, let's kick off the discussion with our first question. Do you think sufficient help is currently being offered to international students in regards to mental health? Karsten, would you like to start us off? Thank you, Varsha. <clears throat> um, I um, would generally comment that, um, you know, the mental health support for um, particularly uh, young people where we know that um, you know the majority of mental health problems first uh, commence uh, is probably not ideal um, across the board um, and for international students uh, in particular certain pathways are even more challenging um, to access for example those um, that may require a mental health care plan for example um, so generally the answer to your question is probably not I think I'm next, aren't I? Uh, hi, everybody. Um, uh, uh, so, Origin just finished, uh, we just did an international student wellbeing consultation project uh, funded by the Commonwealth. Um, and, and so, part of that project, I went and met with a lot of, this is pre COVID, um, when, uh, we met with a lot of the universities and TAFEs and RTOs across the country that work with it, um, international students or have international students. Um, and, and part of that consultation, we obviously asked and talked to them about what their kind of mental health supports are for international students. And I have to say, I was quite impressed actually with the initiatives and um, a lot of the support programs that are run by education providers and also by students and young people themselves. So it was really great to see um, just a couple of things, you know, like the peer support program, programs across the country, uh, lots of neat the locals types of events. There was animal therapy, employment support programs just for international students. Um, and uh, quite a few of the universities offered sort of 24 seven helplines for international students around mental health and wellbeing. Saying all of that though, um, even with all of those things in place, I guess my opinion is that there is um, a greater need for mental health support um, especially for uh, international students with more complex presentations. It, it felt like there was a lot of things on the university campus or the TAFE campus um, to manage those sort of milder um, sort of mental health presentations. But I think um, getting those young people from the university and that sort of, um, that sort of level um, to, to, the, to seeing sort of a, a more uh, complex presentation at a tertiary mental health service, I think the bridge to that service um, that was a bit difficult to cross and, and often um, young people either weren't getting the help they need or it wasn't available when they were seeking that out. Um, there's obviously lots of um, 
I think it's compounded by the misinformation and um, misunderstanding around the private health insurance and what young people can access through their international, what's it called, the overseas OSHA, is that what we say? In this? Overseas Student Health Cover. Yeah, like I felt like that was, um, that came up quite a lot, that young people didn't know what they were able to access and then when they were trying to access it, they had to pay a gap. Um, and so there's those kind of access issues as well. It's also costs, a lot, you know, it's expensive sometimes to get men mental health support um, if you don't have a Medicare card. So um, that's, I guess that's sort of my long answer to that question. Um, um, I think there's definitely room for improvement, more resources needed. And I think that's more broadly across the whole mental health service sector actually for all young people. But yeah, there's lots of challenges for international students. Mm. Thanks for that, Gina. Stuart, what are your thoughts? Thanks so much, uh, um, So I suppose as a psychiatrist by background, you, you might expect me to sort of just to speak specifically about what Gina and Carsten have touched on, and that is individuals with more complex needs. But I think uh, Carsten and Gina have covered uh, those aspects uh, sort of very well. So I'm going to focus more broadly on sort of the university's uh, responses. And, 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 and I would agree, fundamentally, there is clearly more we can do in this space. But I don't think it's just a function of putting more resources in this. It's about also about using the resources that we have in the system more effectively and fundamentally this is around leadership this is around shifting culture this is around addressing issues mm -hmm. of stigma uh, as, as well so I mean we at the University of Queensland like a number of universities uh, across Australia have taken a sort of good hard luck look at what we're doing uh, to support uh, individuals with uh, mental health issues and promote mental health across the university I think the, the first lesson we learned is that we shouldn't separate out students from staff uh, that actually if we are committed as a university to addressing uh, mental health more broadly, it's everybody's responsibility. Uh, and therefore, whilst yes, there are specific uh, needs of our students and specific needs of international students amongst them, we needed a university-wide policy that supported the entire community. Uh, because unless the staff feel supported, unless the staff are comfortable talking about mental health, uh, we're not going to set the right tone, set the right culture uh, for the institutions. So I think Fundamentally, the, the first message I would have is around leadership, uh, is around tone, is around culture, and taking a whole of community sort of look. Yes, universities do engage and are required to engage in a sort of whole of student journey sort of commitment and support uh, for international students and students in general from pre-departure support through to support on campus. I think one of the other things that struck us as we were developing our, um, our strategy was 25% of our students, one might expect, might experience some form of mental health issue uh, uh, each year. Less than 5% were accessing, for example, our university counselling service. We hope that they're finding support in other ways, and there are lots of great ways to get support, be it peers, be it family, be it community organisations. Uh, but nevertheless, we often continue to be worried that there is an unmet need uh, within our community. And I think just echoing as a final point uh, what Study Melbourne said in their introduction, what Carson and Gina have spoken about, as we seek to address issues around help seeking behaviour, and this is not just for international students, but I think students and staff in general, the importance of champions, uh, the importance of people we can relate to, the people who are comfortable talking about their lived experience, so we can begin to break down some of the stigma uh, and find ways of engaging with individuals in language which resonates, which connects. Uh, so that uh, so people feel comfortable uh, seeking help, be that uh, through sort of uh, through their peers, be that uh, through the organised services on campus, counselling, be that through clubs and societies, or be that through external organisations with whom we have to work uh, and need to work very closely. Thanks, Varsha. Thank you, Stuart. That was a nice segue into my next question. Um, so international students come to Australia with varied backgrounds and diversity. There's been a long-standing discussion around the stigmatization of mental health amongst international students. Um, how do you think we can address this and what are your thoughts on this, um, Gina? Sorry, just unmute myself. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I, I guess in Australia, and, and maybe this is because I work in mental health, I feel like we talk about mental health a lot more openly in Australia, but, and we have these major organisations like Headspace and Lifeline and this, and so there's a real conversation in Australia about mental health. 
Um, obviously, um, there's a lot more to do and, and I manage employment programs and, and we see a lot of stigma from employers still in Australia around mental health and so forth. I guess um, some of the feedback from the surveys um, that we did with international students, stigma did come up quite a lot. Um, I, I guess um, a lot of international students might not have used the same language to describe mental ill health in Australia, uh, sorry, um, in their own country and then come to Australia and, and, and you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, it, it's very difficult to talk about those things openly if that's not just your general day-to-day -day way, of, way of talking and, and um, interacting around mental health. Um, I guess that, that point again about um, the private health insurance as well and not understanding and maybe feeling like um, they're not sick enough or, or, or can't access, you know, because healthcare, for example, in another country may, may mean something really different and, and, you know, the way people might think about, oh, I can't access my health care for, for something like feeling a bit down or depressed or whatever. Um, and, I, and I guess there's, in my opinion, there's a lot of work to be done in, I guess, diversifying the mental health workforce um, for any mental health service seekers, actually, but in particularly around groups um, like international students, so that when those young people come in, they can actually see someone that might have, you know, understand where they're coming from, that, that clinician or that um, service has got a diverse workforce that can, that can engage those young people well. Um, I'm not sure if that answered all the question, but yeah, that was, I guess, my sort of feedback on that one. Thank you, Gina. What are your thoughts, Carsten? I think um, based at Headspace Sunshine, you are you know, exposed to a more diverse um, group of individuals. Um, mm. Some of them might include international students. Um, so yeah, do mm. share your experience. Thank you, Asha. Yes, look, um, we are now in our 13th year of uh, operation, and I'm certainly uh, pleased to say that we have come a long way with our community during that time, and yet may, more needs to you know, be done. For example, uh, we have been very uh, successful in, in engaging our Vietnamese community simply by chipping away, if you will, um, at the block um, for, for many years, and that's through our community awareness work, that uh, we are heavily involved uh, with, be that at schools, be that in, in our community organisations, um, and you know we have we have kind of earned our stripes, I, I suppose, with that community. So um, that you know, lots and lots of Vietnamese uh, people now are feeling comfortable um, to come to our centre. Um, on the flip side, for example, we know that say the, the South Asian communities at our doorsteps, who are the fastest growing, and in fact, uh, in that corridor um, are yet very uh, um, um, you know reluctant to seek help uh, from us and you know Gina was already alluding to it there's a number of cultural uh, reasons for that um, of which we have some understanding but we're just finding our feet with um, you know uh, trying to I guess get a um, you know a foot in the door with with those communities um, but it is fair to say that you know any headspace center in the country uh, will be and i would assume most uh, um, um, services generally will do um, have a very local flavor um, so even in uh, you know with our partner centers in um, you know uh, about 20 or 30 kilometer radius the centers actually look and feel quite different um, and that is uh, you know largely because they are always pitched at the local community level um, and thereby trying to you know um, be, be providing services that are in line with what you know the people need and, and certainly I would um, you know encourage anyone who you know listens to this to you know ring the local headspace center even if they are um, or particularly if they're not quite sure what they can offer um, you know because there's definitely help out there. Thank you, Carson. Stuart, um, from an institutional perspective, um, do you think that you know, stigmatization, stigmatization is addressed adequately to get students, international students specifically, to come and seek mental health services within the institution? If not, how could they possibly improve that? So, 
I think the destigmatization of mental health and, uh, and mental ill health is a work in progress uh, in sort of global societies and Australian society. I mean, I think it is a journey we are all on. Uh, and I think there's a lot of work we still have to do. And, uh, and, and Gina's touched on this, that in sort of in workplaces, we continue to encounter sort of uh, evidence of individuals uh, maybe out of ignorance, um, uh, sort of saying things which sort of perpetuate some of the stigma uh, that we continue to sort of experience. And for example, I was in a meeting uh, earlier this week uh, and, and, and colleagues continue to use the word commit suicide as if sur uh, which is a throwback to the days when sort of when suicide was associated with criminal behavior. And I think that so the language we continue to use, uh, not necessarily intentionally, can perpetuate uh, or associate mental health health with sort of uh, um, uh, with other sort of stigmatizing sort of language. So I think this is this is the journey we are on, uh, and I think it is important that all of us uh, continue to challenge each other uh, in a respectful, in a supportive, in a constructive way uh, to sort of to say, did you really mean that? Or that the language we you use sort of uh, uh, made me feel uncomfortable, um, uh, or it sort of it, it, it's stigmatizing, and I think. Uh, as we're reflecting today, a lot of our international students are particularly sensitive to this because they're already perceiving that they're at a disadvantage within Australian society where the language may not be the language uh, that they grew up with, uh, where they're already sort of uh, trying to find the right words to describe how they're feeling uh, and they're less familiar uh, with how to, to access uh, services. So I think there was a whole of institution sort of responsibility here. It is around leadership. It is around students and staff working together. It is around constructively challenging each other. Uh, and it is around having these important conversations and raising awareness, but more than raising awareness, sort of talking about the opportunities uh, that are available to seek help. But then I think specifically for our international students, uh, it is uh, ensuring, uh, as Gina and Carson have said, that the people who are engaging in support uh, type activities reflect the diversity of the people we are serving. Uh, and I think sort of more broadly uh, that uh, we engage international students uh, as part of that workforce, as part of champions, as part of individuals who are comfortable uh, sort of uh, showing their lived experience uh, using language which resonates more broadly with the uh, um, uh, uh, diverse uh, sort of uh, um, student and staff sort of population. Uh, so that people feel a bit more comfortable. Uh, you know, and the evidence suggests that the way in which we address stigma is through sort of personal connections. It's much harder uh, to maintain a prejudicial sort of uh, attitude if you know somebody, if you have connected with somebody uh, who sort of has an experience uh, um, which you're afraid of uh, or have been afraid of. And I, and I think this is, so the diversification of workforce, mental health champions, uh, ensuring uh, that we create a safe environment where people are comfortable to sort of to, to challenge each other and have these conversations is certainly a, a journey that we're on at the University of Queensland. It's a journey that I think Australian society in general is on and we clearly have a long way to go here. Thank you for that, Stuart. I'm going to push you a little bit further because I remember at the Origin Symposium you shared about what I think is a really fantastic way to ease international students into thinking about mindfulness and mental health, but in a really fun way of having that massive, I think it was a mindfulness session that UQ did. Uh, so I think that's a great effort and I think we want to hear more about that. So th thank you. I mean, uh, um, I mean, I think, one of the great things about sort of uh, about people who work in mental health and, and universities in general is the creativity of the people we work with. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think it's, it's an incredibly privileged position, both in my work as a psychiatrist and my work uh, as dean of a medical school, is, is, is working with individuals who are constantly pushing the boundaries, who are incredibly creative and think of new ways of engaging our broader population. Now, universities are competitive places. Uh, some of that competition is helpful, some of that competition is unhelpful. But sort of uh, uh, one of the ways in which we sought to raise the profile of mental health uh, and in a particularly sort of focused way, 
think of how can we introduce our broader community with strategies that some may find helpful, was we sought to break the Guinness World Record uh, on the largest number of individuals at a single mindfulness session. So on a glorious sort of spring day in Brisbane, I mean, this is a state, uh, the state of Queensland is a state where it's 270 days of sunshine a year. Uh, we sort of brought together uh, our population, uh, our student and staff sort of uh, uh, body to try and sort of smash that record. Now, a university in Mexico had managed to get 700 people together in the same place. That's very impressive. But this being Australia, we like to do things bigger and better. And, uh, um, uh, and I think we counted somewhere in the region of 1,200 uh, individuals at that mindfulness session. And we got the, the Guinness World Record adjudicator there to sort of uh, to validate this sort of and they had to participate for a full 30 minutes without use of their mobile phone, which was really tough for some people, in a sort of a, a guided mindfulness uh, sort of lesson. But Varsha, if uh, truth be known, there were almost 2,000 people there. We was robbed, uh, but, we, but the, uh, the adjudicators couldn't count everybody. But there were certainly sort of at least 1,200 people within the zone uh, who, were, who could demonstrate that they actively engaged uh, in the mindfulness session. And it's just one example. Uh, of how uh, sort of creative organizations uh, um, like the uh, people on this panel today uh, can sort of help to engage uh, your, your, your broader community. And it was, a, it was a lot of fun and I certainly sort of uh, learned that I can switch off my mobile phone for 30 minutes uh, and that the world doesn't end. I reckon you can do one better, mate. Now with COVID, I think, and everything being online, you can smash that record again, don't you think? I think we should try, indeed. Oh, that's an opportunity right there. Um, okay, we'll jump into our next question. Um, what is your message to international students who are fearful or anxious about reaching out for help? Um, what can they sort of expect if they were to, you know, reach out? Um, what sort of the process they would go through? Um, and I think it's, it might be slightly different at the institutional level or if they approach Headspace or Origin directly. So I think we might start off with Gina. I was going to say, um, Carsten might be the best one to start this one off because um, you're on the uh, on the ground. But I guess from my um, perspective, I would say to international students, don't give up. Services are it, it, obviously with COVID, um, there might be a wait when you go um, to book in or when you call to make an appointment. Um, but um, don't give up. There's there's people there that want to talk to you and support you. Um, if you've got some friends that you can talk about this stuff to, um, in the, you know, um, and and share your experiences and seek support from your peers, that's fantastic. There's e headspace. There's um, that can support you in an online capacity. Um, we obviously have the headspace network across the country, um, and but also there's a lot of private clinicians that can also um, provide support to international students through their private health insurance as well. Um, and there's lots of other helplines, and obviously I, I imagine you're putting those out there um, on this website. Um, but I think Carsten might be better to speak to actual access on the ground as well. Um, so I might just mute myself. So you I think that was already a very nice uh, message and I concur uh, with you, uh, Gina. Um, again, with, with you know, absolute authority, I can only speak for my own center, but I've done this job now for over 10 years. So I, I have quite a, a, a good connection with other centers across the country. And I can tell you that, you know, um, for, and again, it, it is it's pitched at the, the um, you know, youth bracket in our case, that means 12 to 25. Um, and, you know, I don't know what the age bracket uh, average is for international students now at universities around the country, but I certainly know for the universities in our catchment area, there's quite a few that, that are still in that age bracket. Um, these services really are, um, you know, um, specifically pitched at working with young people and their important others. Um, people in these centers are passionate uh, about young people. Um, when you walk in there, uh, you know, you, you really don't have to worry, um, you know, that, that anyone will be looking at you strangely or so quite the opposite. I think uh, Headspace really, the green door everywhere in the country really, uh, you know, stands for, you know, the um, low threshold entry. It, it is, you know, 
really quite different perhaps to what you might expect in the olden days, maybe even in Australia about psychiatry, which was very medical and often very cold. It's actually very warm and, and, and friendly and, and use specific um, service. Um, and even if some pathways might be, you know, um, blocked for you, uh, as I mentioned before, through, say, uh, the uh, Medicare, you know, there are always other things that headspace centers can do that won't cost you a thing. Um, and that, uh, you know, I think you, you will absolutely find out either by hopping on the website, you know, of the, the center that you think you might want to go to. Again, important to know that no center has a catchment area, so you can walk into any center you like irrespective of where you live or where you go to uni you might prefer to go to a center that is not uh, where you live or not where you study that's completely fine uh, with us um, so hop on the website or ring the center find out what they can do because you might be surprised that there are actually quite a number of options that have nothing to do with needing to go to a GP uh, you know needing to be um, I suppose eligible for for a health care card or, or um, a Medicare card there are plenty of things that we can do and um, the other important question I'd say I would put there please don't wait um, and delay um, access uh, to help because we know that we know when people are delaying that their problems usually get worse um, and you know uh, conversely we know if we can nip things in the bud meaning if we can you know uh, intervene early um, that usually uh, progress is quicker um, and also welfare is um, more longitudinally sustained meaning you have you know fewer or reduced risk I suppose of becoming unwell again in, in the future this is a really really important message and that is the truth in uh, international communities this is not only about white Anglo-Saxon guys like myself uh, this this is true and stands true in all communities across the world. Thank you, Carsten. I just have a question for you. Um, so you mentioned to seek help early. Um, what are the signs that students should look out for? If I was someone at university or, you know, in my course, I'm just stressed. Is that something that I could potentially seek help for? Or, you know, what does mental health or mental ill health look like um, for me to even think about reaching out for help? Mm. Well, I have to be very mindful now that I don't uh, talk for the next 35 minutes because this is sort of a, really a, a, you know, a very passionate area uh, for me. Um, look, when Headspace was first created, the first slogan, which is actually still written all over, you know, uh, our brochures and whatever, um, is and was, you know, for young people who go through a tough time. Um, so this is not uh, uh, saying, you know, this is for young people who are mentally ill. Um, so in answer to your question, absolutely, we want people to seek help um, for, you know, emotional problems before they get on top of them. Uh, and study stress is a really good example. Um, you know, I would assume that, that, you know, knowing from certainly from my experience working with um, student counseling services, that there would often be a very a good first go-to place, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, managing some study-related stress, there are some great ideas, you know, there's obviously disability services integrated for, uh, at universities that can, you know, be assisting, you know, with the, with the um, you know, learning plan and, and potential considerations. Having said that, if that pathway is, is not, um, you know, preferable or has been exhausted or other interventions may be uh, sought after that the, the uni can't offer then any headspace uh, center would be more than uh, happy to to see you know international student um, you know before really um, they become really mentally unwell potentially so short short answer to your question is um, you know whilst the, we want to see people before actually they have diagnosable illnesses um, because recovery is quicker um, does take far less uh, um, you know invasive therapies if you will so medication for example is often then not required at all and it boosts um, you know resilience uh, throughout life meaning that you can build on those you know coping strengths um, if you are in trouble again um, and you know therefore uh, you know preserve some of that welfare um, you know and well-being longitudinally. 
Thank you, Carsten. Um, Stuart, so Carsten mentioned coping strategies. So is this something, say, a student, international student who's struggling with, um, you know, juggling their studies and working part time um, or financial stress? Um, is this the sort of help they would sort of be expecting when they approach their institutional counseling services? Thanks, Harsha. And these are certainly areas where sort of student counselling services uh, can help and, uh, and are often sort of well placed uh, to help. I mean, there's a sort of somebody who can sort of listen, provide a sort of safe space, a non judgmental space, and sort of work through sort of a problem solving uh, sort of a way as to sort of uh, uh, as to how can we work through the issues which you are experiencing. I think the other points I, I would make uh, in building on what uh, Gina and Carsten have said, that somebody who is uh, fearful about or anxious about reaching out is you're not alone. Um, uh, a lot of us uh, experience uh, significant distress in our daily lives. A lot of our students uh, experience significant uh, uh, distress. Uh, and that distress is on a spectrum uh, from sort of from stress all the way through to the mental illnesses we've been talking about as well. And student counselling services are one of the range of services available uh, to support our students. And with respect to those services, they are confidential. Uh, I hesitate to use the word quarantined in the COVID-19 about They're quarantine services, protected, ring-fenced uh, services. Uh, the, um, they create a sort of a, a, a safe space. Uh, and they are the people who you're meeting with in the student counselling services are not involved in making academic judgments or anything like that. Uh, so don't be afraid of seeing them because it might prejudice your career. It won't. Uh, uh, and experience uh, suggests as Carsten uh, has a bit that sort of people who delay are more likely to experience issues. It's a good idea to get in there early, problem solve, work through these issues, work out what the best, most appropriate service is for you to reduce the risk. Uh, of encountering any difficulties uh, further down the line. Uh, so, uh, uh, so you're not alone. Uh, there are people there to help. There's no one size fits all. Student counselling services work for some. Headspace is the right option for others. Other individuals will want to see GPs uh, or may need the support of specialist mental health services. Uh, there are a range of options uh, available, uh, including sort of uh, telehealth online resources as well. Uh, if, uh, if, if you're unable to get there in person. Thanks, Varsha. Thank you, Stuart. Carson, I just was wondering um, if I was an international student who's wanting to seek help but not really keen on a one-on-one -on -one session, is there sort of a group session that I could possibly attend or, you know, is this something that's available? I would um, again um, only be, be knowing this with uh, you know absolute certainty for you know a handful of centres, including my own, and the answer is absolutely. Um, again, um, centres uh, will look at um, diversifying you know the way that that they offer supports um, you know regardless of perhaps of, of where they are um, but perhaps specifically to to cater to in our case you know a, a, a very very um, a multicultural group of, of people at our doorstep so we know that sitting with someone who you've never met for 50 minutes in a, in a room or right now in fact uh, via telehealth um, is not everybody's cup of tea. Um, and so absolutely we have other ways of engaging uh, with people. For example, we have an increasing, um, and, and Gina was, was touching on it before, workforce of, of young people under our employ or indeed volunteering their time as part of our youth advisory groups um, who are you know, able to, to talk to young people who you know, might, might not yet be, be ready or are a bit um, you know, fearful potentially of, of coming in. So again, to provide a really you know, easy step into to the door um, and potentially, you know, not not end up seeing a counsellor if that's not what they're, they're they're interested in. That's totally fine. So, at my centre, for example, we're running a you know workshop series uh, at the moment that we call Mental Health Masterclass, uh, and in that, you know, people uh, learn a, a range of well-being skills uh, and lifestyle, you know, interventions basically um, that you know, will will promote their mental well-being.
team and they may not need more than that particularly if their problems were small uh, to begin with so there's a range of services certainly it's not all as as, uh, as Stuart said a one size fits all thank you for that Stuart do you think that institutions could potentially or maybe they do already offer it um peer-to-peer -peer support is that something that you think would be feasible and you know sort of helpful for international students into dipping their toes into talking about mental health yes i think i think that is important and it's certainly something sort of uh, we're exploring here at the university of queensland um i think we have a duty of care as well uh, to the peers and making sure that they uh, don't find themselves in situations where they themselves uh, are working beyond their level of competence or sort of uh, or taking on responsibilities which they shouldn't but but yes uh, um, one of the sort of the um, the other areas which we are sort of uh, rolling out at the moment is the mental health champions network uh, which are trained members of our community students international students staff international staff included uh, who are comfortable who are prepared to stand up and identify themselves and they get a nice badge as well uh, um, to say that I am comfortable, I'm somebody um, who will sort of, uh, who you could come to, who you can discuss issues about mental health, and I won't be there to solve your problems, but, I'm, but I know somebody who can help, because I'm not a counsellor, I'm not a, a specialist in mental health, but I'm a critical friend, I'm a supportive friend, and I will be able to direct you uh, to services uh, and support services uh, that will be able to assist, whilst at the same time being comfortable talking about their lived experience uh, and also advocating more broadly within their workplace, uh, within their faculty, uh, within their society, their, their student club or, or, or student society. So I think, yes, there is a clear role for peer-to-peer, near-peer, uh, and creating that sort of culture, that community, uh, which is supportive of individuals um, who have taken, made the effort to inform themselves and are prepared to stick their head up above the parapet and say, yep, this is important. Uh, I want to talk about this and if you have any issues uh, you can come to me and I can help you find the most appropriate uh, sort of source of help. So so yes, uh, really important and we want more. And, and Basha, if I can just add to that. I was just um, going to ask you about, because Study <laughs> Melbourne mentioned in the uh, video that they have been working with Origin to train international students with lived experience. So. Yeah, so, so, so I guess peer workforces aren't a new idea in the mental health sort of service system. I mean, we're still growing that workforce, it's emerging, but it's something that we've actually, um, we do have a peer workforce, especially at Origin and in, in, in our Headspace centres, um, and something that we really strongly support. Um, and, and our project with Study Melbourne is to um, build a training package specifically for international students to learn about peer work but also to sort of develop some implementation materials for the university sector who would like to employ international student peer workforces. So we do have, um, we are going to be launching a peer work, um, some peer work um, a policy piece and some training materials over the next month for, for the broader sort of peer works sector. Um, but this project with Study Melbourne, will, that sort of is kicking off now and then over the next sort of six months we'll develop that product and then that will be ready to sort of launch in the new year. So hopefully we'll be able to do that in person at that point, I'm hoping. <laughs> but yeah, very exciting um, opportunity there to bring um, international students into the peer workforce space. I think it's a really exciting opportunity for the education sector as well. I think it's a really nice touch because international students tend to relate to each other better. Um, so I think just knowing that the person that I would be speaking to is an international student, I wouldn't feel that much of, I need to explain myself and my circumstances. You would sort of resonate with me. So I think that's really great. Um, my last question for the day um, would be, given COVID-19 has presented international students with a whole range of different mental health issues and stresses that they've sort of never experienced before especially being international students in Australia. Um, given the online studies and social distancing, um, what are your messages to them in terms of keeping in touch and staying on top of being you know mentally well and happy because they're very much isolated and their friends and family are not close to them. So what are your thoughts on that um, Stuart? 
So yes, I mean these have been sort of incredibly sort of challenging, uh, challenging times. I mean I think one of the, I mean, as you might have been able to tell from my accent, I'm not from these parts. I've been in Australia for three and a half years, uh, and uh, and so really becoming acculturated into Australian society. It's taken me a while to understand that yeah, but now means no. I thought yeah was the important word, but it's the second word that was important is yeah, but now. And I'm now working out which words I can shorten uh, uh, in general. But I think the sort of the, the key sort of issues I've sort of discovered in all of this is, that, and it goes back to one of the points we were making earlier, there's no one size fits all. Um, I have certainly found uh, that I'm more connected with my family back home than I would make more of an effort uh, to get in touch with them on FaceTime, on Skype, or on sort of Zoom. Uh, than perhaps I did uh, in the past, uh, and people are much more comfortable now with sort of online platforms. Uh, we at the University of Queensland have piloted a sort of a virtual village, a sort of a, an online sort of platform to bring people together, and probably around 10% of our sort of uh, community uh, engage with that. Um, as uh, other activities sort of come up, uh, 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 open up again, and sort of an, and as lockdowns sort of get relaxed again, I think it is important to sort of to get out there and sort of even in a socially distanced uh, environment to try and recreate uh, and rebuild the clubs and societies uh, that are part of the fabric, the lifeblood uh, of, of our society. Um, so yes, I mean, I think the sort of uh, uh, the key messages for me are there are various ways in which people can sort of connect and keep connected. Uh, I think it is important to sort of perhaps during these more challenging times to make even more of an effort uh, and, uh, and, and, and I think one of the things that I have certainly appreciated, and I know a lot of students and staff uh, appreciate as well, is, is that I think as we're all in this together, is people making more of an effort and reaching out uh, to each other and sort of just checking in. Are you okay? Uh, what's happening? Or sort of, uh, uh, can we have sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, virtual sort of uh, um, drinks or virtual sort of, um, uh, sort of catch up sessions, uh, sort of, and I think it, I think there are other ways uh, in which we connect. But the fundamental message is we are social beings. There are various ways in which we can do it, and we need to stay connected uh, during these uh, during these challenging times. So uh, back to you, Varsha. Thank you. I think Netflix party has been a big hit given um, the lockdown and I think it's coming back up in Victoria because we're back in lockdown. Um, Carsten, what are your thoughts? Um, firstly, just to uh, reiterate, absolutely, I agree 100% with Stuart. We know that uh, connectedness is, you know, uh, probably the most important protective factor um, for, you know, good mental health. Um, and that's why I'm also thinking that, you know, our government's continued uh, this talk about social distancing is a bit pro problematic because we don't want people to be socially distant. We just want them to be physically distant. Um, so absolutely stay connected. Um, having said that, there are some really, you know, I guess, um, easy to do and probably well known already uh, lifestyle interventions that we can all engage in um, that, you know, may make it a little bit more likely that we uh, keep well and certainly would refer you there to maybe again um, the, the Headspace uh, website, um, you know, if you log on there um, and, you know, click on young person support, you will get what's called the seven tips for a healthy Headspace. Um, these are things like getting enough sleep, you know, eating the right stuff, you know, do, getting some exercise, which of course, even in lockdown in Victoria is, is still uh, one of the four reasons that we can leave the, the house and so we should. Um, so there are some really simple things we can do and perhaps it is, you know, still uh, possible to do some of that uh, together. So I've, ha I've certainly had had the pleasure of doing things that are the weirdest kind of stuff, really. I would never have thought of doing like yoga online uh, with friends, you know, via Zoom, for example. Um, so there are some really, you know, despite this being an, an, an incredibly challenging time, also some really wonderfully weird, you know, experiences. And as um, you know, Stuart said, I've been in Australia now for over 20 years, but I probably feel more connected now with my you know, friends and family in Germany than I 
have for an awfully long time. Uh, we would never have considered catching up via, you know, Zoom that regularly. And all of a sudden it's like, you know, almost a daily occurrence. So it's, it's actually possible to stay, you know, connected and on top of things. Having said that, there's certainly also, you know, the worry that I carry um, that, um, you know, mental health related problems will um, be more likely to, to come our way um, simply because of, you know, economic uh, downturns and, and, and stressors clearly that are evident in, in everyday life uh, and international students will be no exception. And as you said, Varsha, perhaps they're even more hardly hit, uh, you know, uh, harder, I should say, hit than, uh, you know, maybe um, um, other people in the community. So it's really important, again, that we look out for each other, um, that uh, you know, I love uh, how Stuart said, you know, the asking, are you okay? Not only on are you okay days, so, but on 300, you know, 55 other days of the year, um, you know, because we know that particularly young people turn to other young people first for support. And it's the first thing that they do, even ahead of families um, and certainly ahead of people like me, like, you know, mental health professionals. So, you know, having each other's back as, as peers and friends is an incredibly important thing. Thank you for that. Gina, what are your thoughts? I, I Pretty much what Carsten said, what Stuart said. Yeah. Um, but also, I guess one of the things that um, I've noticed in myself is to try not to obsess over the COVID news cycle. Um, it is overwhelming. And I think, I know myself, if I start watching it too much or looking at it on Twitter too much, I start to get quite anxious about it. So I think it's about making sure you lock that time away potentially. Um, also, I guess when I catch up with friends on Zoom or whoever, um, I think it's good to maybe think about having a ban on the COVID conversation a little bit, um, maybe having a two minutes on COVID and then talk about other things that you've been catching up with, you know, other interests and other things just to kind of not, not, not make that the whole, um, the whole world at the moment because it's pretty easy to get caught in that hamster wheel and it's pretty um, stressful once you get there and you can't get off. So, I mean, the other things, I mean, obviously I've been told the cool thing to do is bake sourdough right now. Um, I've tried, I tried to make some gluten-free bread the other day. It was, it was kind of not that stressful when I was doing it, but then when I looked at the result, it was not great. <laughs> so I was a bit more annoyed at the end. But I think, um, you know, just getting, trying different things if you can, because this, you know, in some ways we have a lot more time, like I have a lot more time because I'm not traveling to work and I, so I've been trying a few things that I wouldn't normally do, I guess. So um, exploring other hobbies. Is good. Good thing. Yeah, that's a good segue because um, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but we actually had a poll going on while we had the session. So it was, how do you distress? And we see that going for a walk is what majority um, of our audience do. And then there's exercising, not many keen on painting. Um, so Gina has just shared that she did sourdough. She, baking sourdough is something that she picked up during COVID. Um, Carson and Stuart, what about you guys? Um, what is your thing to do to de-stress? Uh, well, I do a number of things, but I think perhaps my number one thing would be music, both making and listening to music. Cool. So I think I'm with you on the Netflix party. Um, I have transferred my love of going to the cinema to sort of to binging uh, on box sets. <laughs> I am right there with you with Netflix. Um, it sometimes turns into a black hole where you're, especially if you're watching um, a series because it's one episode after the other. So yeah. Thank you so much um, for joining us today, Carsten, Jean and Stuart. Really appreciate your time and your insights. Um, I'm definitely going to give sourdough baking a try now, um, just to see how it turns out. Um, yeah, so we've come to the end of our session today, um, and I hope the audience have gained a lot of insights as much as I have. And if you have any concerns or, you know, you want to reach out, we've been sending links throughout the, the session in the chat box. So, and if you have any issues um, or you don't know who to reach, sees us always here. So reach out to us and we can put you in touch with your institution or Headspace or Origin, wherever that may be. 
we're not done just yet. Um, for our audience today, we have a special surprise. We're actually announcing the CESAR Individual Category Awards right now. Um, so stay tuned. We will release the winners in a tick.